flying into Boston two days ago, um, the airplane magazine had an article on meditation. And you know something is really wrong if an airplane magazine has an article on meditation. <laughs> and they're talking about all the benefits of meditation, particularly meditation strictly as a technique for lowering blood pressure, um, improving your gray matter, um, being more creative, having a better sex life, all kinds of things that um, come from just, just a simple meditation technique. It's kind of like those ointments you, you can sometimes get in Asia that treat everything from insect bites to paralysis. Um, and I can understand why a lot of people would like to have a technique like that that would basically help them function more, more efficiently, more creatively in the life they've chosen. Oftentimes people, after getting started in the technique, will come to a place like this with the name Insight Meditation in the name of the center. And they're told that simple mindfulness or a simple tranquility technique is not enough. Mindfulness needs discernment, tranquility needs insight in order to be a complete practice. And people will then look at what is um, meant by insight in the Buddhist tradition. And many people are a little bit reluctant to take it on because they see the three characteristics that they're called, often called. Um, start with things are impermanent, Things are suffering, and there you then you either there's reference either to no, no self or not self. Sounds pretty daunting, and you're wondering what kind of worldview you're buying into. And particularly, it seems like, given that this is often touted as what the Buddha t has says is the nature of the world. Things are impermanent. Things are uh, stressful or unsatisfactory, and again, either there is no self or it's just not yourself. Um, seems like how are you going to find happiness in a world like that, that given that this is the parameters of what the world are? What's left but sort of a bittersweet resignation, I will go for the pleasures of life knowing that they're going to slip through my fingers eventually anyhow. So it's kind of a resigned attitude and with a little bit of bittersweetness into it. And people wonder, well, why would I want to buy into that worldview? Isn't there a better worldview for the kind of life that I would like to lead? Tonight I'd like to address that issue. Um, pointing out, to begin with, that for a large part it's based on a misunderstanding. The misunderstanding is which comes first, the quest for happiness or the Buddha's description of the way things are. Um, as I said just now, it's often presented that this is how the Buddha described reality. Everything is impermanent, things are suffering, things are not self. Sounds pretty bleak. And then within that bleak landscape, you are supposed to find some kind of happiness that would necessarily be impermanent and have a stressful side and then ultimately be beyond, be beyond your, your control. The actual f framework and content are actually switched in the Buddha's teachings. He starts out with the quest for happiness and he says that there is a, a true happiness is possible. Um, in fact, the first question he says that leads to discernment or that leads to insight is not what is the nature of reality. The first question is what when I do it will lead to long-term welfare and happiness. And then the teachings on, on the three, three characteristics um, fall into that question. That question is the beginning of wisdom for two reasons. One is that it is pointing out it, your happiness, long-term welfare and happiness does depend on your actions. It's not something that's going to kind of float by or float to you without your having done something in that direction. And then secondly, long-term is better than short-term. If you get a short-term happiness, I mean, we, can, we all know what that's like. It comes and then it goes and then it hurts. And then you find another one, and it comes and it goes and it hurts. And perhaps if we look for something that was more long-term, it would be a wiser choice. Um, there's a f f verse in the Dhammapada, one of the collections of the Buddhist poems, which says basically, if you see that there is a greater happiness that comes from abandoning the lesser happiness, the enlightened person, here by enlightened they don't mean full enlightenment, they see somebody basically who's wise and perceptive, will forsake the lesser happiness for the sake of the greater happiness. Sounds like a no-brainer. Um, in fact, there was a translator of the Dhammapada who wrote in his note, he says, I don't think the Buddha could have meant this, because it is just too obvious. We don't need a Buddha to tell us that you go for the long term instead of the short term. Well, you look at how people lead their lives, <laughs> and we do re need reminding that okay, the long term is better than short term, because it does require that you 
forsake certain pleasures in the, in the immediate present for the sake of something that's going to be more lasting. Um, the three characteristics then come in within the context of that, basically asking you, okay, this happiness that you're looking for, is it really long-term? Is it really worth, is it really happiness? Is it really long-term? And is it really something that you would like to claim as your own? And in fact, it can, it, the three characteristics can be derived from that question. You know, we're looking for long-term. Like if something is impermanent or inconstant, then it's, then it's really not long-term. Secondly, if it's stressful, it's not happiness. And if it's not long-term, it's happiness, not happiness. Would you really want to claim that as yours? Is the kind of happiness you want? Or do you want to look for something better? So the three characteristics are basically telling you, true happiness is possible, don't settle for second best. The, and this, it's kind of like an assayer's test that you would assay gold. Is this really gold? Is this really long-term welfare and happiness that you would want? Does it pass these three tests? Is it stressful? Then it's not. It's, if it's painful, suffering, stressful, excuse me, if it's inconstant or impermanent, then it's not. If it's stressful and painful, then it's not. And then why would you want to claim it as yours? Those are the questions that the three characteristics are asking. So as I said, part of the misunderstanding has to do with this, where is the framework into which this, these concepts go. Secondly, there are some misunderstandings about the concepts themselves. I'd like to go through the three. To begin with, the term three characteristics, which is often sometimes translated as three marks of existence, indicating that this is kind of the way things are. The Buddha never used that term. You can search the whole canon, and you never see these three qualities or three adjectives referred to as three characteristics. He refers to them as three perceptions. Perceptions that you want to hold in mind as you look at something. And see, okay, remember, if you see this, remember this is impermanent. Do you want to go for it? And part of you will say, yeah. And then they'll say, really? <laughs> And that's what the other two questions are for. It's stressful and it's going to be out of your control. Do you still want to go for it? Um, so they're perceptions as opposed to being characteristics. And the question is, when do you want to apply these perceptions? That's the big question. Secondly, in terms of each of the terms, um, the first one often translated as impermanent. The word is in Pali is anicca, which literally means inconstant. So it's not saying that you know, things are going to end at some time, but kind of in the meantime, there's going to be a lot of up and down. Things cannot be constantly going across in, in, a, in a straight line. Um, the word dukkha, which is the second characteristic, <coughs> which is often translated as suffering, it really covers a wide range of things, everything from stressful to painful to suffering. Um, and it covers that whole gamut. The Buddha is not saying that life is suffering. That's another one of those teachings, you know, false Buddhist quotes. The Buddha never said life is suffering. He said there are certain kinds of suffering, certain things are suffering or painful. I personally like to use the word stress when we, when we use the word dukkha here because for, for three reasons. One, I had a friend in Bangkok who was a journalist, and he asked me one time, why do Buddhists talk about suffering all the time? I don't have any suffering in my life. It's, this is not relevant to me. And I asked him, do you have any stress in your life? He says, yeah, yeah lots of stress. Says, okay. That's what we're talking about. Two, um, there are very subtle levels of dukkha that can be find, say, in, found in very intense and very deep states of concentration. Now, you wouldn't call it suffering. I mean, suffering is like you know, your, your family is wiped out by a disaster or you know, something really strong like that. If you're sitting in meditation and there's just, just a slight little bit of weight on the mind based on the fact that your concentration is unstable, that's not really suffering, but it is stressful. And it's important to note that because many times people will get into a state of concentration, say, you know, total bliss, total, you know, total positive. If you don't look, f look for the subtle levels of stress, you're going to miss some important things going on in your mind. So stressful is useful to call your attention to that. And then the third reason is that it's really hard to romanticize stress. <laughs> you can romanticize your suffering. Suffering is what makes you noble. Suffering is what makes you deserve the compassion of other people. Stress, everybody's stressed out. So it, it helps you step back from it and be a little bit less inclined to want to identify with those kinds of things. So those are basically the three perceptions that the Buddha has you 
apply to any situation where you're asking yourself, I'm going for happiness, and he assumes that all of our actions are for the basis of either, or for the sake of either pleasure, happiness, bliss, ease, some kind of well-being, however, however, however we define that. All of those terms are def- come under one term in Pali, which is sukha, which is the opposite of dukkha. We're looking for happiness. If what we're doing is not leading to something that's really happy, do you still want to keep on doing it? Right? This is the way the Buddha himself found awakening. He looked at his actions first and said, is this leading to the happiness that I want? Because um, these three characteristics actually then relate very directly to the kind of happiness that he did want, which was something that was free from aging, free from illness, and free from death. I mean, his standard for happiness was very high. <laughs> <laughs> So we're not talking about you know, resigned resignation or acceptance of our things. He's saying, you want to hold your hand standards high for what, true, what counts as true happiness. And the correlation between inconstancy, stress, and not self, and aging, illness, and death is pointed out in a sutta. There's a young man from a wealthy family named Ratapala who decided to leave his, um, leave his wealth, go and become a monk. He returned home to visit his family. And after visiting his family, and they basically tried to get him disrobe, and he said, look, I'm not interested in that anymore. Um, left the family and then went off to stay in the king's pleasure garden. They, the kings back in those days had the wildlife refuges of, the, of that India of those days. And so staying basically in the wildlife refuge, the king planned a trip there that day and found out, however, that there's this young monk staying in the garden. And so the king said, okay, let's call off the pleasure trip. I want to go talk to the monk. And so he approaches the monk and he says, and here, most people ordain either because they've lost their relatives, they've lost wealth, they've got bad health. Um, none of this applies to me. Um, but the king's assumption was this is why people ordain as monks. Here you are, you were wealthy, you were young, you, you, your relatives are still alive. Why did you ordain? And Ratabala says there are basically four teachings of the Buddha that really s- hit home with him that made him want to ordain. And they're called the four Dharma summaries. The first one is, the world is swept away, it does not endure. The second one, the world uh, is, offers no shelter, there's no one in charge. The third one is, the world has nothing of its own, one has to pass on, leaving everything behind. And then the fourth one is, the world is insatiable, insufficient, a slave to craving. The king questions him on these four summaries. The first one about the world is swept away. And the, the questions that the king asks and the answers that Ratapala gives shows the correlation between the three perceptions and aging, illness, and death. First one, the world is swept away. Ratabala says, okay, how old are you now? The king says, I'm 80 years old. He said, when you were young, were you strong and fit and for battle? And the king said, yes, I was. In fact, I thought I had the strength of two people. He said, how about now? Do you still have the same strength? And the king says, oh no, sometimes I mean to put my foot one place and it goes someplace else. Which I think is a nice detail. <laughs> That's what aging is all about. You think it's going to do something, the body does something else. Um, so impermanence, inconstancy, is correlated to the aging process. The second one, the world has, offers no shelter, there's no one in charge. And the king says, what do you mean by that? Here I am a king. I'm in charge of the com- uh, my, my country. And he says, do you have any recurring illnesses? The king says, yes, I have one. In fact, sometimes it gets so bad that my courtiers are standing around and saying, now he's going to die, now he's going to die. Um, and you wonder what tone of voice they're using. <laughs> and he says, now can you order your courtiers to share out the pain so that you feel less? And the king says, no, I can't do that. Okay, so pain, suffering, stress correlates with illness. Death. It has nothing of its own. The world has nothing of its own. One has to pass on, leaving everything behind. The king says, what do you mean I have nothing of my own? I've got storehouses full of gold and silver. Ratabal says, when you die, can you take that with you? Well, no. Not self-written big. I mean, you're, you're, everything you've got, including your body, all your possessions, all your relatives, even all your thoughts, are going to have to be dropped at death. So death correlates with the teaching on not-self. I forgot to mention not self. That's a big one to explain. Let me back up a bit. Um, sometimes you hear it in, translated as no self. The Buddha never said there was no self. He never said that there is a self. In fact, the question of whether the self exists or does not exist was one that he put aside. Um, what he did say, however, is that um, 
the way you create a sense of self is a kind of action. And when it comes under action, then the question is, what kind of selves are skillful? When are they skillful? And you f you'll find that in the text, the Buddha does talk about c cases where having a strong sense of, a healthy sense of self is a positive thing on the path. Um, one example is, when you're starting to get discouraged in the practice, you remind yourself, okay, other people have been able to do this. They're human beings, I'm a human being, they can do it, why can't I? Now technically, in the Buddhist terms, that counts as a form of conceit. But he says that kind of conceit is actually necessary on the path. So there are times when a healthy sense of self is useful. Another one is, you know, you're getting discouraged in the practice and you remind yourself, the reason I started practicing was because I wanted a true happiness for myself. Do I no longer want true happiness? If I don't want true happiness, I don't really love myself. So maybe I should stick with the practice if I really love myself. Um, you can see these two kinds of self as basically the self as the producer, the one who's able to create the conditions for happiness, and the self as consumer, the one who's actually going to experience the happiness. Now there are times when those senses of self are useful. There are other times when they get in the way. And a lot of the path is going to be figure out when do I use a particular sense of self. And you have many senses of selves. We all, we all have a stable. And they're not all human beings. <laughs> you know, there's the self of the, the, the self at work, the self at home, the self when you're out shopping, the self of the citizen, the self of the consumer. Um, and, the, and even within those particular contexts, the, you will play many roles. And a lot of the practice will be figuring out when are particular roles useful and when are they not, and how can you learn how to drop some of the ones that are not, not useful. So this, the teaching on death is 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 the big no not excuse me the big not self teaching. There are certain things that even though they may be yours up to point, you're going to have to drop them at some point. And the question is, what do you do then? You need training in the mind, okay? And then and then the question of your own mind at some point, you're going to have to drop that too. But the amount of effort you invest in that will be more likely to lead to a long term happiness than the happiness that's, that's totally dependent on possessions or totally dependent on on status. Now, the, those four Dharma summaries, the first three, as I said, correspond to the three characteristics. The fourth one points out the problem, which is that the world is a slave to craving. The king says, what do you mean by that? I'm not a slave. And Ratabella asks him, suppose someone were to come from the east and say, there is a kingdom to the east which is wealthy, prosperous, all the gold you would want, <laughs> in typical sexist detail, all the women you would want. Um, and your army is strong enough to take it, would you take that kingdom? And here the king is, 80 years old. He says, sure. <laughs> okay, suppose someone came from the south and said there was another kingdom to the south with all the same characteristics. Would you take that kingdom? Of course. Another kingdom to the west? Yes. Another kingdom to the north? Yes. One across the ocean? Yes. And Ratabal said, this is what I meant. The world is a slave to craving. People never know enough. And this points to the problem. Things are in constant stress, while not self. We keep coming back to aging, illness, and death. Things that will short-term happiness, basically. We keep going for it because of our craving. Now this then relates to the other context in which these three characteristics are used, which is the teachings on okay, why do we suffer to begin with? I mean, there's a suffering just in the fact that things are impermanent. That's not necessary, necessarily a burden on the mind. And John Sawat made a comparison one time. We, the monastery in San Diego is located across a large valley from Mount Palomar. And he pointed to the mountain one day and he says, is that mountain heavy? And you know when a John asks a question like that, it's a trick question. And, and so nobody dared answer. And she said, okay, if you tried to pick it up, it would be heavy on you. If you don't pick it up, it's not heavy on you. It might be heavy in and of itself, but if you're not trying to pick it up, its heaviness doesn't matter. And that's the distinction between suffering in the three perceptions and suffering in the Four Noble Truths, which you know are the, you know, the, the first truth is the truth of stress or suffering, the second one is the cause, the third is the cessation of suffering, and the fourth is the path to its cessation. Now with that first Noble Truth, again, it's the tr truth of stress, this is a particular kind of stress that comes from craving. 
the craving that would that drove the king to want to conquer all those kingdoms. And the Buddha said, this is the stress that weighs on the mind. The fact that things change doesn't necessarily weigh on the mind. But the fact that you identify with things and cling to them out of craving, that's going to cause that change to weigh on the mind. So it's good to keep that distinction in mind. The Buddha is not saying that all of life is suffering. He says specific things are suffering, and it comes down to the things you cling to. That's going to cause the suffering. He goes into the five aggregates, which we don't have to go into tonight unless you want to. Um, but he says anything that you tend to identify with as a basis for how you define yourself, how you define how you're going to feed off the world, and that's an interesting point. The Buddha says our basic relationship to the world is one of feeding, not only physically but also emotionally. We feed emotionally off our relationships, we feed emotionally off of um, our success or lack of success in, in various areas of the world. Um, the suffering is caused by craving and clinging, the craving that comes together with clinging. It can be cured by putting an end to the craving, and you do that by following the path. Now each of these four truths has a duty that's related to it. Um, stress or suffering is something to be comprehended, and you want to, in case you want to understand, you want to be able to look at it. What is the stress that's weighing down on my mind right now? And when you comprehend it, then you see, okay, this particular thing, it's your clinging either to your body or to your feelings, to your perceptions, i.e. the labels you put on things. You're clinging to the way you make, make up thoughts, and then you cling to your consciousness. Those are the five things we cling to. And it's because we have passion for these things that we cling to them and crave them. So we have to find out some way to get rid of the passion for these things. <clears throat> now, once you see that that passion or that craving is the, the, the cause of stress, you, the duty with that is to abandon it. You let it go. <laughs> you do that by developing the path. That's the duty with regard to the fourth noble truth, so that you can realize the third noble truth. In other words, you see that when you let go of the craving, the suffering actually stops. Now that third noble truth can be interpreted on two levels. One is the permanent level. I mean, when you gain total awakening, there's no more craving, bang, there's no suffering. But also you can see it on a day-to-day -day level that if you actually were to look at when a particular craving ends, the suffering around that issue will also end. Um, you can gain in some insight into how you cause yourself a lot of unnecessary suffering in life. The problem is that when we drop craving, we're not lo really looking carefully at the fact that we're dropping craving. We're actually going to another one. You know, we've lost interest in the first one and because there was something else that pulled your attention away. And the Buddha is actually saying that what you have to do is to realize that st stress ends when craving ends. That's what you have to keep looking for, so that you can begin to see, oh, this is how I'm creating unnecessary stress around this. The question often arises, how do the three characteristics relate to the Four Noble Truths? And you can't map the, the three characteristics onto any one of the truths. What you can do, though, is you can see how the three characteristics function in performing the duties with regard to the truth. Um, I was talking with someone last week who said he didn't like the word duty with regard to Four Noble Truths, because one of the reasons he came to Buddhism was he didn't want to have any duties. Um, and I said, well, it's, these, these are not duties that anyone is imposing on you, but they're basically written in the way that if you want to put an end to suffering, this is what you got to do. It's a conditional duty or conditional obligation, um, and it's up to you to take them on or not. With with reference to the first noble truth about clinging to the aggregates, you apply those three perceptions to anything that you find that you're clinging to. Um, for instance, you find that you're clinging to your body having to be a certain way. Uh, years back, one of the duties that monks perform in Thailand is that we get invited to hospitals often when someone is about to die. And either, they're, either the person who's dying or their relatives ask, could you please come and teach some dharma to the person who's dying? And there was one case in particular we went, and there was this man who was suffering from liver cancer, and he had this big bloated belly here. And so the head monk, I, w I was a junior monk at the time, the head monk was telling him, okay, you have to get your mind quiet, get it focused so that you're not going to be overwhelmed by the pain. And the man said something really interesting. He said, it's not the pain that is bothering me. It's the embarrassment. And it turned out he had been a phys ed professor, a phys ed teacher, and he had been always prided, prided, 
prided himself on the fact that as his friends were getting fat and old, he was still saying slim and trim. And then the body turned on him and he had this big bloated belly. And so he was more concerned about the embarrassment of his swollen body, his swollen belly, than he was actually about the pain of the disease. Which you can see, that's a lot of unnecessary suffering. I mean, no, at that point, nobody's going to say, hey, you, get up off the bed. <laughs> get those abs in shape. It's, not, you know, it's nothing that people think about at those times. But this man was causing himself a lot of suffering around it. Um, if you can see that, okay, you're clinging to this, you can see one, the whole thing was inconstant to begin with. Your body never made a pact with you that, okay, I will, stay, I will stay fit all through your life until you've decided you have enough, and then we can part ways peacefully. <laughs> And I will also warn you beforehand, before there's going to be serious illnesses, just make sure it's convenient. <laughs> or before you start losing certain functions in the body, I will let you know so that you can be prepared. There's no agreement at all. You've signed on, you didn't look at the, you didn't look at the fine print. Okay. Okay, this, this body is impermanent, so when it changes, you have to, okay, this is the way it is. Can I, make my, can I allow my happiness to depend on the body? The same principle applies to the other, other characteristics. Um, and it's interesting that the questionnaire that the Buddha, other, other, what they call the aggregates, the questionnaire that the Buddha applies here shows again that his main concern is not to so much as to get to the true nature of reality, define that, and then work away from that. The first question is, what will lead to true happiness? And then apply the perceptions there. Because what he says is basically, is it inconstant? Yes. If it's inconstant, is it easeful or stressful? Well, it's stressful. If it's stressful, and is it worth calling yourself, you or yours? This is me, this is what I am, this is myself. Now, if you were trying to just kind of give a picture of reality, you would say, well, it depends on how you define self, whether you would want to call that self. But the other question is, what he's really asking here is, is it worth it? You know, there's a part of the mind that always is calculating, if I do this, is it going to be worth the energy expended? Okay, if I identify with this, is this going to be worth the effort? And many times you say, well, I do have to use my body, so I have to take care of it, so I have to regard it as somewhat mine. But there will come a point where the body's going to go its own way, and you have to be prepared for that. So I say, okay, this, this, is a, this is a temporary contract we have here with the body, and I have to, and I have to, learn, how to learn how to put that down. It's not worth clinging to as me or mine. Otherwise, you die and you hover around your body. And that's another story. And if you have questions about that, I'll talk about that later. Um, uh, so the questionnaire in terms of the first, no, first noble truth is this questionnaire of, is it worth identifying with? And this is a, in the ultimate sense, that if you're looking for happiness that's deathless, you would say, no, I've got to find something better than this. In terms of the second noble truth, the same thing, the same principle applies. This cl clinging that you are engaging in, is it really worth it? Um, and we'll see later on that when you're working on the path, there are times when clinging is necessary, but there are other times you'll find that certain things you've been clinging to along the way are really better left let go. So you, say, you apply that same questionnaire. In terms of the path, say you're sitting and meditating. Distractions come up in the mind. This, these three characteristics are very useful to apply, or three perceptions are very useful to apply to anything that's distracting you. When it comes up, okay, the pleasure that this, this thought is offering, say you're sitting and meditating and you're thinking about how you would like to go down to the, the pizza place down the street after the end of the meditation. Okay, is, is this something you should be thinking about during meditation? We say no. But you also say, nobody's watching my mind right now. I can think anything I want. Um, so it's up to you. Do you want to spend your meditation period thinking about the pizza, or do you actually want to improve your powers of concentration? And so you say, well, the, the, the pleasure offered by the pizza, or the pleasure offered by thinking about the pizza, and that's the issue. And you can, it takes, what, 15 minutes to eat a pizza? You can think about pizza for hours. You know. <laughs> and that's the problem. Okay. Is it worth it? Is it that the pleasure is a very impermanent kind of pleasure. It's stressful. And then it's not really worth claiming as mine. So th this perception that these three perceptions are best applied to anything that would distract you from your practice. And you can use these in all kinds of areas, not only when you're meditating, but in, in terms of you know, holding to the precepts, 
and uh, practicing generosity, it's good to think of, okay, the pleasure I would get out of, say, eating this particular apple, as opposed to the pleasure of giving the apple to somebody else, which is, which is greater. Now, if you're really hungry, you say the pleasure of eating the apple. But there comes a point, we've really had enough apples. You say, okay, maybe I should share. And even sometimes, even you haven't quite had enough apples, but I'd say, I'd be happier to be able to share. It gives a sense of, a, a, an inner sense of wealth, which is longer lasting. So you can apply to anything that would pull you off the path of you know, practicing generosity, observing the precepts, or practicing meditation. These three perceptions are very useful to help sort of cut through any attachment you might have that would pull you off. Ultimately, there does come a point where you would start applying these perceptions to your own practice, i.e. states of concentration you can get to that you might be really attached to. You can see, well, maybe there's something better than this. Let it go. It's not, it's not that you see concentration coming and say, oh, con concentration is in constant stress, well, not self. I won't even go there. You go there first, you develop it, and then you let it go only when you've got something better, which would either be a higher state of concentration or something that, is, that would actually be um, unconditioned. So you see these three characteristics are used to apply to things that would lessen the level of your happiness and get in the way of finding a greater happiness and related to the practice of the path. The Buddha analyzes um, the whole process of letting go into five steps. Say you see anger is a problem. He says, first thing to notice is how it arises, how it passes away. Really look carefully at how it arises and how it passes away to see where the trigger is. Um, that, of course, relates to the perception of inconstancy. But not only that, um, we have a lot of confusion about anger. Suppose you have a sudden burst of anger, and then the burst of anger subsides. But in the meantime, a lot of hormones have been churned up in your body, that sort of the flight or fight hormones are there. You see the body's reaction, you say, I must still be angry. And so he says, let's have another round. <laughs> and it keeps going and going and going. The anger feeds, the, the mental factor of the anger feeds off the, the physical repercussions. If you could learn to see, okay, the, the mental anger is one thing, the physical reaction is something else. Okay, you can learn how to breathe through that so that you're not in kind of the anger breathing can stop, that stops the, the hormones. And then you can breathe through any tension that comes up in the body with the flight or fight response. And you can actually clear things out in the body and then you begin to realize, okay, even though the ups and downs of the hormones in the body may not be all that indicative of whether you really are feeling angry at that particular time. So you can begin to see that the anger something comes and goes, rather than being this long slide through anger. So you want to see the things coming, you want to see when they go. Okay, when they come, what came with them? When they went, what went with them? You're looking for cause and effect. And one of the things you see that comes with it is what the Buddha calls the allure of the anger. In other words, why you like it. And this, this comes down to a second pair, which is that the things that you're clinging to have their allure, but they also have their drawbacks. And you want to be able to see both at the same time. Our problem is often, say with anger, when you're not feeling angry, you say, gee, I'm, I'm just too angry, I don't, want, I don't like this about myself, I really wish I could put an end to my anger, because you see all the problems that come from it. And then all of a sudden something comes along, <laughs> there you are angry again. And th when that came along, you dropped all thought about the drawbacks, and all you could think about is why you wanted to be angry, what was attractive about the anger. And when you, get into, when you begin to look into this, often it's kind of embarrassing. This is why it's good to have a good state of concentration, so your mind feels stolid, solid, stable, still, has a sense of well-being. Then you can look at, okay, why do I go for these stupid things? And not feel too embarrassed to admit to yourself, because oftentimes what what you'll find with the allure of the anger, there's a sense of power, there's a sense of, you know, your, your, any sense of shame or compunction, they just go and you feel liberated for a bit. And there's something inside you that likes that. Well, that something inside you that likes that is your inner child. They often talk about you know, getting in touch with your inner child as if the inner child is someone who has reasonable demands. <laughs> I have a friend out in California, she's a psych psychotherapist, and she says that the only people who have the right to talk about their inner child are pregnant women. <laughs> so you begin to see that you go for things for many times for reasons that you would not ordinarily want to admit to yourself. 
But you, okay, when you finally say, okay, this is why I like the anger, this is why I like lust, this is why I like greed, this is why I like jealousy, this is why I like feeling put upon, all the various unskillful emotions, they have their allure. And you want to see, why do I get attracted to them? And when you can see that, and then you can compare them to the drawbacks. Okay, if, when I go for that, this, this is what comes down the line. Is it worth it? So this basically comes down to the, the issue of stress. I mean, these, this, these drawbacks are very stressful. And the question is, is the payback worth it? And when you get to the point where you see it's not worth it, that's when you develop dispassion and you can let go, which is the, the fifth step. Right? You develop dispassion for these things, which is the not-self. I don't want to claim this as me or mine anymore. I don't want to take on that identity anymore. So those are the five steps to letting go. You see the thing arise, you see it pass away. You get to see exactly what's arising and passing away along with it. You see the allure, and you see the drawbacks. And then when you finally can see that the drawbacks way outweigh the, the allure, then you can develop this passion. And you have a chance of letting go. And in the letting go, it's not that you're letting go into nothing. The Buddha says when the mind has freed from these things, that's when it actually attains higher level, levels of freedom. It, craving is a form of slavery. So these three characteristics are not so much having you resign to the fact, well, any happiness I look for is going to be impermanent, so I just have to learn how to squeeze the most I can out of those little moments of happiness, with, let them go with kind of a bittersweet um, farewell. He's saying, look, there's a higher happiness that's available if you will go for it, if you will admit it. And these, this is the test to show, one, what does qualify as a genuine happiness, and two, helps you see the things that you are holding on to that would get in the way of that higher happiness. So I hope this clears up some of the misunderstandings around the issues of what the Buddha means by insight and how insight functions. And yes, you are, if you take on the Buddha's series of questions, you are kind of buying into a kind of worldview, but it's not a very pessimistic one. In fact, it's very optimistic about the power of human beings to find true happiness, um, which is a very positive, positive thing. Now, that's one of the reasons why people tend to resist the issues of insight, um, is a misunderstanding. The second one is the idea of an undying happiness scares some people. You don't like to have your life measured against, you know, how far did you go in the path to an undying, undying happiness? Um, and the Buddha doesn't push it on you. He's not saying, look, you've got to go for this. But he's saying, look, you're missing the chance of a lifetime if you don't go for something that is more lasting, that gives the possibility of, of a happiness that's not going to turn on you. Um, and that's the choice that each of us has to make. Are we up to, it's basically his teaching on this topic is a challenge to a lot of the way we would live our life and our, our ordinary worldview. Um, so that's the challenge. But at least I want you, the purpose of this talk was to help make sure that you didn't misunderstand what he was talking about. It's up to you to decide whether you actually want to adopt his policy for how to find happiness in life, a happiness that's really worthwhile, worth the effort that goes into it, that would be for your long-term welfare and happiness. In fact, that's why he says at one point, this is why you would learn not to identify with things that change and are stressful, because it is for your long-term welfare and happiness that he gives this teaching. So that's all I have to say for tonight, for the talk. Now I'll be happy to answer questions. Yes? Thank you for listening. To learn how you can support the teachers and Dharma Seed.